Hey everyone, I'm back on to share a bit of my testimony with you today. I haven't been on in a while to upload videos, um, but I intend to do that. I got some good words of exhortation and encouragement from some fellow YouTube videos that I watched, um, and I felt like that was confirmation from the Lord to not back down on sharing because um, I think it'll make more sense when I share my testimony why I'm hesitant um, sometimes to put those things out because I really I don't trust myself um, which sometimes I guess leads to not trusting God and how he has spoken to me or things he has given to me it causes me to doubt so just I'm gonna try to do this briefly um, I feel like it may help somebody I feel like it would help um, my few subscribers to just kind of understand a little bit more about me and why I'm even on here, uh, why I feel compelled, and also, um, you know, we have overcome him. I mean, Revelation talks about those who overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives um, so much as to shrink from death. I don't know the exact wording, um, but I feel like that's pretty close. Anyway, a little bit about my background. My birth mother was in the occult um and when i say occult i mean the occult i mean uh sacrificing to um satan you know worshiping lucifer the whole nine um i was three my brother was five when we were adopted but i just told my adopted family basically everything i was just like a little chatterbox that i couldn't be quiet my older brother was afraid of what might happen to him. So he always kept everything inside and tried to get me to be quiet because of what they had told us that they would do to us if we spoke out. But I just didn't have a filter, I guess, when I was little, because I just, I just spoke about things that no three-year-old would even know about unless they had actually witnessed. Um, and some of those things that I had said was, um, well, my brother and I have uh, we were neglected, we were starved. I actually almost died of malnutrition several times before I was a year old. Um, my mother didn't take care of me. I was told that she didn't really want me. She doted on my brother, but I was kind of forgotten about. I was taken into, um, you know, picked up by the police for um, directing traffic in my diaper, in nothing but a diaper. Um, you know, we would play around construction sites. I remember vividly actually standing, we lived in a trailer home out in the middle of nowhere. And I remember my brother and I would hide dog food. I don't ever remember having a dog, <laughs> but we would hide dog food in our bed, like under the covers and wherever we could so that we would have something to eat because we didn't have a lot of food. I remember standing on the countertops trying to find ways to break into these cans of food that we would find um, we and we couldn't find a way to open them. So I remember doing that. So I, I don't remember that feeling of hunger, but I remember doing those things. So I'm like, we must have been pretty hungry if we were doing those things. Um, the other main thing that I remember, I remember, this wasn't told to me, was my brother and I saw uh, a human sacrifice. We were taken out um, to this place. Um, in my mind, it, it's like an old house. Um, I don't know really any of the details about it, except we were supposed to stay in the truck. Um, and I'm guessing it was either my mom or a stepdad. We had several men in and out of my mom's lives that we were exposed to and suffered abuse at their hands. But, um, we went up to, I remember going up to the window and looking inside and what we saw was like a, a semi-circle of um, people in these dark cloaked, dark cloaks with hoods. Um, they were chanting something and they held this baby up um, and there was a fire going, we were in the semi-circle around a fireplace and they held this baby up and were chanting and then they threw the baby in the fire and I remember I was telling my adoptive parents, I, we heard the baby crying, and then they threw the baby in the fire. So I had um, PTSD from that when I was little, and there was something that came on the TV one time, and people were kind of going around the room like this, I don't know, 
dancing like that. I don't know if it was the music. I don't know if it was the way they were dancing, but I literally freaked out and ran upstairs. I mean, little things like that would be triggers for me. Um, the other main thing, which is why nobody can convince me that Satan isn't real. Nobody can convince me that the supernatural isn't real because of my mom's involvement in the occult. Um, she, we were in, seemingly we were in our trailer alone. Um, and what I, and I don't remember this. I, my, I've been retold, I've been told this by my adoptive parents because I explained it to them when I was three years old when I, we came to live with them. Um, <clears throat> but because of her involvement in the occult, there was some, I don't even know what the picture looked like, but there was a picture on the wall and Satan came out of the picture. And my mom got so frightened that she ran in the bathroom and locked me out with him. And what I explained to my adoptive parents is that he had a dog face and long red fingernails, which he was clicking on his teeth and he kept repeating that he was going to get me. Um, now I had some exposure to church because my adoptive parents um, actually took me, like it's a long story, my, they, my adopted dad and my birth mother were actually first cousins. And they had a relationship with her because they were trying to help her out with us because they felt sorry for us and um, they knew she wasn't taking good care of us. And um, so she would actually go to my, adopted parents, which were her, my dad was her cousin, and would leave us with them and um, for periods of time. Um, there was a period of time she lived with them and we lived with them. Um, and, she, and then whenever she got a new man in her life, she would want us back and she'd want her family back. And um, so she'd take us back. So that happened, you know, several times. Um, so whenever we were with them, we would go to church with them. So I, I must have heard the gospel. I must have heard of Jesus because when he was in my face saying that he was going to get me, I just kept repeating, Jesus is my friend, Jesus is my friend, and he went away. Um, and the reason they found out about this is because I, they realized that during the night, after we came to live with them, during the night, um, I would get up. I First of all, I had to have all doors um, I had to have all drawers, all doors closed. Nothing could be open in the middle of the night. And I know that's kind of common for, for kids. Um, also, whenever they would, I would see a picture, I would say, is that coming out of the picture? Is that coming out of the picture? And they couldn't figure out why I was saying that. And then also, I hated red fingernail polish. I, whenever somebody wore red fingernail polish, I would grab their hand and say, get that off. Because <laughs> I, I mean, they didn't know. So. My parents were trying to, my adoptive parents were trying to figure out why I was having all these triggers. They couldn't get to the bottom of it. Um, and then my aunt was staying with us um, one night. And so what I would get up is I, I would get up in the middle of the night and I would fidget and I would get into things and just, I don't know if that's how I was coping, I guess. And so they laid newspaper down in my room around my bed and my aunt was sleeping in the room with me. And so if I got up, she would hear me and then she could maybe try and help me talk about what I was afraid of. Um, so that actually happened one night um, and she asked me, what was I afraid of? And I told her Santa, um, which they later found out what I meant was Satan. What's interesting to me, <laughs> I don't, you know, is if you rearrange the letters in Santa, it actually spells Satan. <laughs> but anyway, that's besides the point. Um, so I, this is when I told my aunt what I saw and, um, she said the, the hair on her neck stood up and she called for my parents and said, bring the Bible. And, you know, um, I had seen a Christian counselor and she, um, did deliverance over us. Um, I never got rid of the fear until <laughs> I would say maybe 10 years ago and I'm in my forties now. So that fear has stayed with me. Um, I've always been fearful of Satan. I would have dreams of little demons sitting up on my closet door. And um, I would, you know, many nights, I remember as a young girl, I would, you know, and I had the room in the basement, which is silly thinking back, you know, why would I be in the basement when I had all these fears? But um, 
you know, I would sleep with the blankets literally around my head where I had like this much just to breathe. And I, that's how I would sleep every single night. Um, the Lord delivered me from that. So I don't know how much time I'm going to have. I'm already at 10 minutes. So I may need to do a couple more videos because that's just kind of like the start, like my background. Um, but basically just to wrap it up. Um, so because of what my mother was involved with, she actually, we believe she was murdered or I, we don't think she committed suicide because we got the police reports um, and there was no powder burns on her hands or her clothes. Um, but my stepfather at the time, um, he was never charged with any crime, but she basically got shot in the heart. We were actually there when it happened. She was in her early 20s, sadly, um, and she got shot in the heart, and I saw it. We both, my, both my brother and I saw it, and for many years I had this memory of like I could see her laying on the bed, like she was sprawled out and her long black hair was like sprawled out on the bed. And I could see her, but then there was something blocking my view. Well, I didn't find out till maybe 10 years ago. That was my brother, my five-year-old brother standing in front of me so that I wouldn't, you know, see it. He was always very protective of me, um, except for a couple times um, of things that had happened that he poured chemicals in my face when I was laying in my playpen. I don't know if he was put up to it or he was just, I don't know why. I mean, he was just little kid himself but um, that's really the only time that that um, I remember him not being protective of me and I almost died on the way to the hospital so the devil's tried to stuff out my life <laughs> you know long before I even got you know to kindergarten um, and the Lord has preserved my life um, so that's part of my history part of my testimony about how God has you know um, rescued me so after my mother died we came, we, my adoptive parents, um, actually my second cousin, my dad is my second cousin, but they did adopt us. Um, so then we were raised by them in a Christian home. So even though it was tragic what happened to my mother, I feel like the Lord rescued us out of that because there was physical abuse, emotional, obviously abuse, neglect, and uh, sexual abuse, which uh, thankfully I don't remember any of that. Uh, my brother does. But anyway, um, I will continue probably with a part two of this, but um, I pray that this would help somebody or encourage somebody to share their own story of how God has worked in your own life and what he can deliver you from, and that you don't have to be a victim of your past. You can be victorious through Christ, and he can use everything, everything for his glory, and all things work together. For the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose and i have found that true in my life hello again this is part two of my testimony and um picking up where i left off uh once we were adopted um by my second cousin um so basically we went from my actually my adopted mother um couldn't have children for the first seven years of their marriage um, they couldn't get pregnant and as soon as they adopted us that same year they got pregnant with their uh, first daughter my sister um, so within a within a basically a year of having us us my brother and I um, she had three kids she went from no kids to three kids and so I think that was kind of a stressor on her um, you know, they signed up for it, but at the same time, we had issues. Um, my brother uh, was very, uh, he didn't know how to process uh, what he had been through. And he, of course, he was older than me. He was five. I was three. Um, he didn't open up. So I think that hindered him from really processing as much as me, where I just, I was a blabbermouth. I mean, a couple things I think my mother my adopted mother would say is, um, you know, I was very strong-willed. I was I was an obedient child, but I was also very uh, feisty and very had very strong opinions and very strong ideas about how, you know, I wanted things or how things were, and I was very outspoken. And also, I just had a lot of um, a very strong will to live in. 
Um, and I, and I think the Lord made me that way because he knew I would have to, in, what I would have to endure. So I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that he gave me that strong will to, um, to live and to survive and to, um, come out of that. Um, and today I can truly say that God used it for his good. Um, but because of some of the issues that we had, um, you know, I think it, my mother, you know, became kind of stressed out, especially after she had her second baby, uh, a brother, um, a son, a uh, brother to us. Um, and I just remember, you know, things started to unravel as far as um, how I felt I was treated. Now, I don't hold this against them. It's just a, it's just a reality of what I went through. I know that my mom has her own issues. I know that she loves me very much. I know that they both, my both my parents love me, but um, things started to happen where I just began to feel like um, I was a burden or I wasn't worthy of their love. Um, I was beaten down emotionally. I think that was the big thing for me, especially as I started getting into like preteen and teen years. And I'm sure a lot of that had to do with I was probably difficult. <laughs> you know, I mean, all teenagers go through stuff and um, I just don't know that. I mean, she even admits that she didn't handle certain things correctly. And we've had that discussion and I forgive her. Um, but there was a lot of emotional abuse. There was a lot of beating me down emotionally where I just felt like I had no value at all. Um, I felt I felt rejection from the time basically that I was born. I was rejected by my birth mother. My birth grandmother didn't want anything to do with us. Um, you know, my adopted mother, you know, I didn't really feel like she liked me at all. Um, and I had two siblings who were blood to them um, that I felt like took a higher priority as far as their emotions went. Um, and as far as the treatment, like we were, we were, they were very strict on us, but less strict on them. And again, that could have been the dynamics of older versus younger kids. I mean, every, it doesn't matter if you're blood or not, the younger kids, um, you know, it's always said of them, they got away with more, you know, so th that's part of it. It's part of the natural thing as well that happens in families, but there was a lot of emotional abuse, um, just feeling very worthless, feeling like I was stupid. And I was actually told I was stupid. And, um, you know, just, I, I was very forgetful. <laughs> I don't know if that's a teenage thing. I still don't have a great memory. I still forget things. Um, and that's a kind of a sensitive subject for me. Like I never want to appear stupid because I felt stupid. I mean, I felt like I would never amount to anything. And, um, just comments made about my appearance um, and just who I was in general. I just I just felt really beaten down. So that kind of plays into my personality um, and some of that I've st I'm still overcoming the insecurities. Um, I've just felt like Satan's been on my back since I was born to make me feel rejected, make me feel worthless and make everything that make me feel like I, I couldn't possibly contribute or, or be anything. And I've worked really hard. I have, I have a bachelor's degree, you know, I, um, you know, I've accomplished things in my life. I have four children, two grown girls and two little boys. And I feel like I've accomplished a lot in my life that I still struggle with feelings of worth. And, um, and I think that's why I have doubts. Um, there are more doubts about myself, but they, again, can translate to doubts about, would God really speak to me? Because who am I? You know, um, I have a hard time accepting compliments because I just don't believe it. I don't believe it about myself. And again, I'm not, <laughs> please don't compliment me just for the sake of complimenting me because you want me to feel better. I mean, I, I just, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well with me. Not that you wouldn't be genuine. I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but I just, I don't, I don't think highly of myself. And I think that's a good thing. Um, 
you know, and there, I know there's a difference between not thinking highly of your, yourself and, and not thinking you have any worth. And the Lord and I are working through that. So anyway, with that being said, um, that's kind of why I struggle with doing videos on YouTube. Even though I feel the Lord compelling me to share what he shares with me, um, I have thoughts like, well, what difference does it make? You know, there's so many YouTubers out there that say it's so much better than you. So they have so much more uh, eloquence. Um, you know, they look better on camera. They're, they're more compelling in the way they speak. And um, you're just going to get on and look like a buffoon because you are a buffoon. <laughs> you know, that's kind of like how I've always felt of myself. Like, who am I, you know, to even think that I can have um, influence or anything like that. But the Lord has shown me that, you know, it's not about me. It really isn't. It's about Him. And I just want to be a vessel. I want to be a servant of His. I want to be an ambassador um, to proclaim His name, His salvation. And to anyone who will listen, whether they listen or not, I guess, still proclaim it because then at least my hands are clean. At least I've done what the Lord has asked me to do. I've been obedient to him. And, you know, people can reject me. But if I'm being obedient to Christ, I know he will never reject me. He will never leave me or forsake me. And that's been a big theme in my life. Like, you know, the rejection is actually preparation for persecution that's to come. And I feel like I was born for such a time as this because we are at the end of days and... You know, if I had been a wimp, if I have thick skin, if I can't handle that somebody doesn't like me or that somebody, you know, says something bad about me, if I can't handle that, then how am I going to handle persecution? So I feel like my whole life I've been in training for this time, for this time in the end of days where we are going to see persecution. Um, and we are going to have, we are already seeing it. I have actually saved several articles um, in the news lately that that point out specifically the uh, persecution that's happening right now. It may not be flogging people in the streets, but there is persecution going on in our nation right now, and it's on the increase. And so I feel like, you know, all of this rejection that I have faced, all of these, um, you know, this, this view of myself that I feel like um, I am nothing. And I am nothing without Christ. So I went from I am nothing, even to Jesus, even to anyone, to, to where now I recognize I am nothing without Christ. But if he can use me, I'm going to do my darndest to bring him all the glory I possibly can because he deserves it. He rescued me out of a pit. Um, I, you know, again, I said I was raised in a Christian home. Um, there was hypocrisy. You know, like there is in a lot of Christian homes. I've, I've even, I've been a hypocrite. <laughs> you know, with, with my two older girls, they saw hypocrisy in me as I was raising them. Um, so that's not a dig against my parents. Um, they did the best they could, um, you know, with what they had. And um, I love them very much. We all deal with hypocrisy. We all deal with our own issues. Anyway, um, so I rebelled when I was 18. I left home. Um, and I, within a year, I was pregnant with my first daughter. Um, my parents lovingly took me in and helped me raise her for the first year of her life. And then my, the, the man that I, um, that was her father came back into our lives about that time. And I felt like it was the Lord, um, bringing our family together because during that time I had turned back to the Lord, um, you know, and so within six months, we were married. I got pregnant right away with my second daughter. And that I remember the first, uh, the first year, of her, the first year of my youngest daughter's life. The night before she turned one, um, my husband came home high on something. At the time, I didn't know what it was, but later found out he was um, smoking crystal meth. And he had had drug problems all along, but I felt like when we got back together that he had reconciled that he had actually got saved because that was kind of one of my prerequisites at the time. Like I wanted to save him so we could get married. And 
And so, you know, he did and it was superficial and he, when he got hurt on the job, he went right back to um, the drugs and then it kind of down spiraled from there. When my daughter was a year old, that's when things started to spiral out of control with his, um, with drinking and with crystal meth and he was also smoking pot. And um, so we ended up having to leave um, that house because we lost our house. He went into Teen Challenge um, and he actually was on a really good track. He knew more about the Bible than I did. But then um, once he got freedom again, he turned back to the drugs. And I ended up having, after two years of undecisive, you know, because I didn't believe in divorce. I didn't believe, I knew that God hated it and I knew he hated it for a reason. And, but I, at that point I had no choice. You know, he was unfaithful to me in the marriage and also he abandoned us. Um, so I ended up making that hard decision. And then I had years of where, you know, it was just me and the girls and I was kind of living my own life. You know, I kind of walked away from God again and backslid into the world. Even though all my life I would say I never stopped believing in God. I always believed in him and I always knew that he was there, but I didn't really give it much thought. I mean, I didn't really, I had a strong relationship with him at times, but then, you know, I got easily pulled back into the world. Um, and so um, I'm going to probably have to do a part three because I think I only have 15 minutes and I don't want to have trouble uploading this. So uh, I'll leave it there and I'll upload um, part three. Hi guys, this is part three of my testimony and I'm going to wrap it up in this video. I'm not trying to talk, be long winded, but it, you know, it's a lot to try and fit a whole life into, you know, three 15 minute segments. <laughs> or three 13 minute segments. Anyway, so after I got divorced from my first husband because of his drug use and, and infidelity and um, um, abandonment of our family, uh, I stayed single um, for probably about five years raising the girls. And in that time, um, like I said in my last video, I wasn't really following the Lord. I was. It was kind of like my second rebellion because everything that I wasn't allowed to do um, when I was at home, which for good reason, um, and everything that I didn't get to experience because I got pregnant out of wedlock and, you know, within a year of leaving home, um, I kind of felt like I just kind of went a little wild, um, and just was out in the world experiencing, you know, going to clubs to dance and, um, getting in relationships and, you know, um, extra, you know, like fornication and drinking um, and just not giving much thought to how I was living and how that didn't line up with how I was raised or what I believed and I was a complete hypocrite. Um, I went to work for a company and that's where I met my husband and I really fell head over heels for him before he even knew, you know, knew me very well or I mean I just saw a lot of qualities in him that I really adored and I really wanted in a husband I knew that he was strong I knew that he was stable I knew that he um, just had a lot of very strong um, manly characters about him like he was just a very strong person and I admired a lot of things about him and after quite a few years of me basically kind of chasing him, which I never had done ever. Um, you know, I, he, he realized that he cared for me as well. I ended up leaving that company so that we could actually pursue, um, our relationship and get married. And he had never had kids, um, never been married. And so right away, you know, we had, you know, struggles because a blended family is really hard. It's really hard to have a blended family and um, we were not on the same page and I didn't know how to be a, a wife and uh, we just didn't see eye to eye um, with raising the kids and there, you know, there was struggles on both sides. Both of us were, you know, guilty of, of certain things, but it was not a healthy environment for our girls and um, I remember just praying desperately to the Lord at one point because I was just tired of living, you know, in turmoil. 
um, and thing and being not being on the same page with my husband I didn't you know I, I saw a second divorce in my future and I'm just like no God I know you hate divorce I don't want to go through this again I know the damage it does in so I'm just pleading with the Lord pleading with the Lord and pleading with the Lord and um, I think that finally I was ready to hear the answer because one night I was just crying and crying out to the Lord like Lord show me what's going on and before that I had always thought well <laughs> God, show me, show him that he's wrong, because I know he's wrong. So just, if you just show him, then we can, like, get on with this thing. Um, but there there came a time where I was just like, Lord, I don't care. I just want to know the truth. I just want to see what the problem is. I just want to see what can I possibly, I was just at my end, end of my rope. And I was just, I would, and I think that's how God is. We come to him completely broken and empty. And then that's when he can step in and you know, finally get to work because we get out of the way, we get out of his way and we're kind of, we're willing to submit to him at that point. So that's kind of where I was. And I'm telling you, it was one of the most profound moments in my life because I um, didn't expect him to do this, but basically he handed me a mirror. He handed me a mirror and he showed me what I was doing in the marriage that was keeping us from being in unity. And usurping his authority in the home um, and not being on the same page with him, letting the girls pit me against him, um, going to other people, complaining about my husband, namely my family, um, and getting them emotionally involved in our conflict uh, were all things that I was guilty of. And I was just completely broken. And I just, you know, I was like, wow, Lord, you're right. You know, I could, I mean, I could have sat there and, and did the blame game and said, well, look what he's done and la, 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 la. But you know what? I, I was like at the point where you're right, Lord, you're right. And I repent. <laughs> and I was truly broken and repentant. And I had realized at that point, it had been a long time since I had repented. And it was hard to do. Um, and, the, and, and Satan will want to keep you in fear of repentance, what that's going to mean, what other people are going to think of you how shameful you're going to look, but you know what? I Can I tell you, that's a bluff. That is a bluff. It is Satan throwing up a smoke screen to keep you in fear, to keep you from repenting, because he knows that the outpouring of grace is going to happen after the fact, and how the Lord's just going to come in and work in your life is going to be miraculous, and he doesn't want that to happen. So don't let fear keep you from repenting. Don't let the thought of what other people are going to think of you um, or how you're going to look or what it's going to expose. Don't let that keep you from repenting because Satan knows as soon as you do, the outpouring of grace is going to just overwhelm you. And you're going to say, I am so glad I did that. I am so glad I repented because you are now back in a right standing with God and he can actually work in your life and make something so beautiful out of those ashes. But he can't do anything with those ashes unless you do the do the repenting and say, I'm willing, Lord, I'm willing for, for me to go from ashes into beauty, whatever it takes. And that's what I did. Um, and it wasn't easy after that. Um, and to tell you, um, you know, when I decided, when I repented to everyone, I repented to my girls, I repented, well, firstly to my husband, repented to my girls, repented to my family. Um, what you just a minute. Okay. Mommy's busy. Okay. Um, and let me tell you, after that happened, um, all hell broke loose in our home. Um, and it wasn't easy. And um, we, we felt attacked by all, all sides. Um, and it ended up being, you know, a time where we pulled back as a family, my husband and my two boys. And, um, you know, we actually... Um, we needed that time to kind of, for God to reform us into the family that he wanted us to be, um, where there was love and respect and, you know, healthy conflict resolution, um, just the proper view of marriage and being unified. And um, sorry, my boys are coming into the room, so I'm just trying to remind them to be quiet. Um, Anyway, so the Lord has done a beautiful work in our marriage and in our family, and I felt like this is this is kind of a time um, where the Lord has just rebuilt us from nothing, 
and is continuing to change us, is continuing as we surrender and submit our lives to him on a daily basis. He's continuing to mold us and make us into what he wants us to be. And um, as a family and as a couple, and we are actually involved in ministry now, and I'm completely you know, sold out to Jesus. I love him more than anything in this life. And I know for a fact, if I have my life with God, um, and Jesus in his proper, if I have them in their proper place, everything else is going to be in its proper place. You can't put family above God. You, all these, all these worthy things that are important can still can't be above God. God's got to be number one and you have to be willing, um, to suffer whatever backlash you may receive from any of those other things that you love, people that you love, in order to have God first. Um, yeah, I had to take family off a throne that I had put on the throne of my heart, um, and I had to really put God first. Um, and But you know what? God's doing an amazing work in both of our lives. I'm seeing growth. Um, my boys, I'm teaching them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Put Him first. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful thing when you have things in their right order. You know, God has His order of things and He tells us these things for a good reason because He wants that relationship with us. He, he wants us to be in a right relationship with Him. And a lot of that has to do with us surrendering to Him because the, the issue is never on His end. The issue's never on his end. He doesn't sin. There's no there's no even shadow of darkness in him. If if we're off with God, um, if our relationship is off kilter, it's it's something having to do with us that we need to give to him. And he is so willing and so gracious and so merciful. When we come to him in a humble and contrite heart, uh, with a humble and contrite heart and in a, in a just a submissive way, recognizing who he is. He's the Almighty. He's the Creator. Um, he gave everything to bring us back into relationship with Him. And I owe Him my life. And I am not ashamed of Christ. And He has put a boldness in my heart. And yes, I still struggle with these feelings of worthlessness. And like, Lord, is that really you? Would you really tell me that? Who am I? And I'm just trying to really push through those lies and just be obedient. And so I would just request prayer for anyone who watches this video. Um, I w I'm willing to pray for you too if you want to leave prayers in the comments. Um, prayer is a huge, huge thing um, that we can approach the throne of God with our requests and our petitions and lift one another up. Um, that is a powerful thing that we can do as Christians. But just pray for me that I would um, be delivered from anything that is uh, not of God, any worthless feelings, any doubt that I have, um, and just to, I just want to be obedient to the Lord. So you pray for me, I'll pray for you, and I just pray that this uh, testimony blesses you, encourages you to share your own story, because God has a purpose for every single person on this earth, and when you surrender to Him, He can use your life to just help so many people and just point them to Christ um, in, in ways that only your story can because um, you're, each one is unique and the Lord works in all of these amazing ways and we have nothing to be ashamed about because God's using everything for our good and his glory. Have a blessed day in the Lord.